It's all over to you guys now. Perfect. Thank you so much. I... Hmm. I'm not sure if Dr. Mufize can hear me. Um, uh, Amina, thank you. I, I, uh, he just texted me to say that he, he he's not able to, uh, he's not in. Um, I can see his in one of the as one of the participants, but I can't. He says that he's, he doesn't. He's not. He doesn't think that he's in, and nothing is happening on his screen. So I don't know what what's what's going on with that. Uh, okay, perhaps we can ask him to to log out and in again. I think he just needs to get connected to the mic and the camera. Okay. Thank you so much for communicating. No problem, thanks. Uh, Azza and Amina, I think you will be checking to admit people in, please. Yes, uh, doing that. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Very happy to, to be having Professor Uma with us today. We're trying to, um, to connect with Dr. Mkhize and he should be joining us soon. I think his connection is, should be working shortly. In the meantime, Professor Uma, how are you today? Uh, thank you, Amina. I'm fine, thanks. I am, uh, yeah, you know, we are, we are back to teaching at UCT. So um, I had a couple of classes in the morning. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I, am, I am happy to be here and uh, excited to have, uh, really honored to have the audience here. Uh, for this launch and the opportunity that humor has afforded me. So I'm very grateful. Thank you, Amina. We're also very grateful. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you. I'm wondering if, if we could ask um, Dr. Mkhize to log out and in again. I think that should, that should help him connect um, to both the yes, camp and the work. I think he texted to say that he's trying to restart his computer to okay. see if the, the app will work after that. It's also possible for him to speak through Skype if he calls you and then we can also just broadcast it. So uh, if that fails, we can do that, you know. Uh, I mean, through WhatsApp, he can call, also call you through WhatsApp and then we can broadcast it. But if that fails, if this fails, thanks. Um, okay. Well, welcome everyone to um, to the Huma book launch. Um, I will do a short introduction of Huma before we're joined by Dr. Mkhize and we could uh, begin the conversation. So I'm Amina Slimani and I'm a doctoral fellow at Huma, the Institute for Humanities in Africa. And it is located at the University of Cape Town the book launches are an academic focus uh, learning space in which authors and members of the faculty at UCT and 
beyond uh, join us to, to speak or, or are invited for a conversation about their most uh, recently released books. So Professor Uma is here to speak to us about his, his most uh, recent book. Um, and the book launch welcomes actually authors from across disciplines and more specifically the humanities because it aims to bring together researchers and, and thinkers to engage in discourses that are aligned with human thematic, thematic focus, which is on, on, being hum, on being human in the continent. And so Dr. Uh, or Professor Christopher Uma is from the Department of English and Literature, African Studies. And his book is entitled Childhood in Contemporary Diasporic African Literature. And he will be hosted um, by Dr. Hwezi Mkhize, who was a lecturer in the Department of African Literature at the University of Bits. Dr. Mkhize graduated with a PhD from the Department of Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania in 2015. And prior to moving to WITS, he taught in the English department at UCT for three years. I'm not sure if Dr. Mkhize is connected. Um, I, I don't think he's connected yet. Uh, no worries. I, I, um, I reckon that there's a there's a power surge in in Gauteng, and there might be compromised connections there. I I hope it will work out soon. But I but I would love to to introduce you, Professor Uma, if that's okay. Um, so Professor Uma is an associate professor in the Department of English and Literary and Literary Studies at the Center for African Studies. Um, both at the University of Cape Town. And his interests are in African and African diasporic literature and, and cultures, black print, black print cultures and Pan-African imagination. He received his undergraduate uh, at Moy University, Kenya, and his MA and PhD at the University of Bits. He has held fellowships at the University of Johannesburg, the Open University in London, UK, and Harvard. He is the author of the book, Childhood in Contemporary Diasporic African Literatures, Memories and Futures, and Futures Pasts, and co-editor of the Spoken Word Project, Stories Traveling Through Africa. He's the author, he's the editor, sorry, of Social Dynamics, a journal of Africana Studies. I think we may have Dr. Kwesi with us. If not, or while waiting for Dr. Mkhize, Professor Uma, could you please tell us a little bit about how the idea of the book began, or the first initial steps that led to the book? Okay. <clears throat> um, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Amina, uh, for this session. I'd like to thank Huma, um, the people working behind the scenes to make this book series, um, book launch series possible. And I'd like to thank the audience who contributed to, to listen to me. I'd like to thank Dr. Kwezim Kizer, who agreed to be a discussant, and everyone else who's logging in from different parts of the world. So this project began um, at the end of my undergraduate studies at Moy University in Kenya. I had just uh, gone through three years of undergraduate studies, and in my final year, which is the honors year, the equivalent of the honors year uh, in South Africa, I um, I came across uh, one of my professors traveled abroad and she came along with uh, Chimamanda Adichie's first novel called Papalite Discus. And I, I remember we were reading or doing a course titled The Contemporary Novel. And I picked up this novel and I, I read it in one night. And I, I, you know, by the time I, I, you know, I, I closed my eyes, I, there were tears running down because I had sat down the whole night reading this novel. And I got really fascinated by Aditya's work. And slowly I began discovering that there were many other writers who um, were publishing uh, about Africa, who were our generation, who had almost similar experiences growing up, who had traveled around the world. Uh, and I got very excited. Uh, and so I, you know, when I came to do my master's at WIT, uh, I began work on Chimamanda Aditya's novels. 
And then I expanded that to include a broad range of other contemporary African writers. You have to understand that part of my excitement was because um, I went, I did my undergraduate in a department of literature, theater and film, and we had been brought up in a very wide uh, range, a wide diet of African writers. And you know, the, there was a sense that there were various generations of African writers. The ones who begin the project of modern African literature in the 60s, who include people like Chinua Achebe and Flora Nwapa and Gugio Yathiongo, those who were sort of interested in the project of, of a national literature and this, this new independence and freedom that had come through uh, during that period and who are publishing and letting the world know that Africa has arrived after independence and it can tell its own stories. So I'd been brought up on a diet that gave me a sense of um, these various generations. That was the first generation of modern African writers. And they would have been people of our, between our grandparents and our parents' generation. And then after that, you had a second generation of people who began publishing in the 70s and 80s, just during the time when there were all these dictatorships in the continent and um, the project of the nation state was starting to fail. Uh, and it was uh, rightly titled uh, The Literature of Disillusionment. So you had people like Ben Okri and um, Aikwe Yama's novel, you know, um, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born, uh, sort of embody, embodies that period. And then, you know, you have this, you know, third generation of these young ones. When I picked up Adichie's novel, I got very excited and I knew that there were all these, you know, continuities uh, between these different generations that I was reading through Papalai Discus. And I'll give you an example. When you, when you pick up that novel, the first sentence of the novel says, things started falling apart. I remember reading that and thinking, wow, well, you know, a, this is, these are just conversations that are, it, it, it felt familiar, it felt um, exciting to read. And so that's how I picked up uh, and I decided that this was going to be my, my master's and postgraduate project. Uh, Dr. Mkiza is calling me. I don't know if I should I should answer and let him be broadcast live. Yeah, that would be. Let Let's explore that option for sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. So he's here. I don't know if you can you can hear us, uh, Dr. Mkiza. Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear Dr. Mkiza? Yes, we can hear him. Perfect. They can hear you. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Amina, over to you. Welcome, Dr. Mkhiza. I hope you can hear me as well. Thank you for joining via WhatsApp. Okay, uh, I'm just going to have to take these out. <laughs> I realize that this is a... Uh... Okay. Uh, okay, I think he can hear you now. Okay, hi, Dr. Hi, Dr. Mkhiza. Thank you for joining us. And apologies for this Zoom glitch. It's... It's so unfortunate that we can't see you, but I think we were able to hear you very clearly. Um, I was able to introduce you, so please feel free to, to introduce yourself once more, if you'd like, and please, the floor is yours. And I would invite everyone who's joining us to drop any questions that you may have for Professor Uma on the chat or ask it towards the end. I'll be the timekeeper, so I'll be able to to let you know when we will be moving to the Q&A. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Amina, and uh, greetings to, to everyone out there. Uh, my apologies, I cannot see you all. Um, the, there was a, there's a big power cut in, in our time. It's also affecting some of the kinds of internet services that we, we're receiving here. Um, so I have some, some notes that I'm going to, um, sort of speak from just as a way of speaking to Professor Oma's book, um, just my, my short, um, reflection and, and hopefully contribute somehow to the, um, to the broader discussions. Let me begin, um, by stating the deep irony of having to engage with the book on childhood by someone whose surname means grandmother. <laughs> I always, I always relish that queer non sequitur. So thank you, Professor Omar. Readers of the African novel will very well remember the magical spirit child Azaro in Ben Ogri's The Family Stroke, which came out in 1991. A cyclical, a beautiful child 
Azaro is bound to the non-linear temporality of being born and dying, only to come to another brief and unfulfilled childhood existence. Until his commitment to his grief binds him to an anguish, earthly life, clinging on to the world of the living against the wishes of his friends in the spirit world. The world to which Azaro's existential commitments lie is much like him, a nation, symbolically Nigeria, fast approaching the moment of independence, yet its development temporarily arrested. Its historical time, much like him, remains unresolved, confounding. Its existential dilemma is that which cannot be written because it already saturates the post-colonial diasporic moment of Aubrey's um, inscription of his sort of writing career. To revisit, um, in other words, Azaro and the novel form deeply steeped in Yoruba mythology affords Ogre to revisit halting and displacing its disenchanting historical pathways. It is, um, uh, it is a world that cannot be re-examined or filled uh, with enchantment by anyone other than the subjectivity and spirit or spirituality of childhood. It should not be surprising that the Femish Road does not, not resolve through the moment of independence. As readers of Mwikiwa Yongo's A Grain of Wheat will remember, that moment yields new ironies and reversals. The Femish Road is but more precursor to the many subsequent works in which childhood opens up vistas of narrative negotiations of the past. Childhood, then, is not simply a stage in life, a moment to be transcended, but a subjective epistemological vista in which the, quote, problem space, end quote, of the post-colonial nation and its foundational discourses are re-examined with the view of its contemporary realities and dilemmas. Professor Omar's first book, Childhood in Contemporary African Diaspora Literature, the first of many, draws our attention to the rich dimensions of the figure of the child in contemporary African literature. Focusing on work published during and after the turn of the millennium, Professor Olma explores how issues of migration of diaspora, race, gender, sexuality, and post-nationalism are surfaced through memories of representations of childhood. As Olma particularly puts it, the child is the subject whose time has come in our economies of critical reflection, and indeed it has. From the work Sorry, from the work of Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, Helen Oyemi, Binavanga Wainaina, Novalet Bulawayo, Chris Avani, and others, it is indeed striking that these contemporary diasporic writers consistently grapple with the multiple, loca the multiple locations, migrations, and their identities through the figure of the child or through memories inherited about the Biafran War, in the case of Adichie, um, of Kenya's first decade first decades of in the case of Wainaina. These authors are, after all, children of the post-colony, whose access to the memory of decolonization and early post-colonialism have been mediated by time, and in some cases through the post-colonial African novel. And I think Adichie is a perfect example of this. In bringing these writers together, Professor Omar does not simply show the childhood methods which he dealt decided authority, but gestures, gestures toward uh, the present, futures, and pasts of the African novel. In other words, child contemporary African diaspora literature is both contemporary and genuine. So, his frame of reference, the works of Kit Riwa, Amadou Guruma, and Kamara Lae, to bring our awareness of our childhood has, since the dawn of modern African literature, been used as a trope to navigate the work uh, of multiple cultural um, experience brought by colonialism. He makes a significant argument that childhood as a set of ideas, as he calls it, also destabilizes the foundational discourse 
we seem to have lost Professor Umar, but I'm hoping he'll be, his internet will be back soon, hopefully in a few seconds. Uh, um, I, I'm really sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, are we back? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. You know, I don't know. I just got kicked out. So um, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just going to call um, uh, Dr. Mkise again. Sorry about that. I'm really sorry. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Yes, uh, we are here, crazy. Um, yeah. Okay. So we're all back on Zoom now. Yes. Okay. So can you? Please, um, I'm trying to remember where I was, but suddenly it's just everything stopped working. It seems. So let me just go back. Um, yeah. In bringing these writers together, Professor Omar does not simply show the childhood matters, which he does with decided authority but gestures toward the presents, futures, and pasts of the African novel. In other words, childhood in contemporary African diaspora literature is both contemporary and genealogical in scope. Not only does it bring into uh, the frame of reference the work of Ken Sarawiwa, Ahmadou Kuruma, and Kamara Laed to bring our awareness to how childhood has, since the dawn of modern African literature, been used as a trope to navigate um, the experience um, the, the sense of multiple cultural experience brought by colonialism, he makes a significant argument that childhood as a set of ideas, as he calls it, also destabilizes foundational discourses of African nationalism and the African state by foregrounding subject, subjectivities with errant or even queer uh, subjectivities and unruly experiential templates of temporality. Narratives of the child soldier, as he puts it, and I quote from page four, gained the multi-directionality multi that Mark Rothberg's book reflects on in his examination of Holocaust memory studies. These memories of war, for many of these writers, are experienced through a framework of inheritance, legacy, or, or heritage. And this framework is influenced, as Rothberg's book is trying to argue, by the politics of decolonization and the Cold War in the latter half of the 20th century. So the space of childhood in which the memories are lived as the legacy of an adult, adult generation of parents, uncles, aunts, and all the siblings, or the heritage of an immediate fourth generation as stories passed down is instructive, end quote. As both the experience of contemporary African identity has shown toward the new, has grown toward new and ever evolving sites of diaspora, so the figure of the child has followed the novel 
into new terrains of identity and its futures to come. Childhood in contemporary African diaspora literature will surely be a generative work for those interested in contemporary African literatures and the novel. Indeed, when Casey Lodeka's first novel, 13 Cents, was published in, two, in the year 2000, its sex worker, homeless child protagonist, Azure, resonances with the Femish Road are quite deep here, shattered any sense that the South African nation's then early post apartheid moment had arrived at any sense of either historical revolution, resolution or new possibilities. Azure is a liminal figure rummaging through the, spit, um, the streets of South Africa's oldest city, Cape Town, indeed turned our attention not to the future that was indelibly a horizon of empty temporal signification to him, but to the deep history of Cape Town and South Africa, to the top of Table Mountain and the indigenous futurities that were shattered before apartheid became a historical possibility. There is much that Professor Omer's book can teach us about how to read such novels, which have grown to include Gobano Matlo's Coconut and Yoanda Omotoso's Bomboy. If anything, childhood in contemporary African diaspora literature has opened up or will open up critical and theoretical possibilities that one hopes will inspire future works and ways of teaching. On a personal note, I would like to thank Professor Omar for many years of friendship, years in which I've witnessed not only his exemplary scholarship and pedagogy uh, come to be what it is, but also the generosity of his friendship and capacious intellectual mind. As we say, Makwande. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mkhise, and thank you, Dr. Professor Uma. Um, I would like to, to ask uh, if the audience has questions for Professor Uma. You can drop them in the chat or you can open your mic and ask the questions. I have a first question, um, and it's uh, something that uh, Dr. Mkhize has mentioned, which is that you bring in and highlight in the importance of childhood within the African literary world. Um, and perhaps this is something you have, you have responded to earlier when, when speaking about how the idea of the book has come about um, and how you've uh, you've decided to, to pursue these topics as part of your master's and later on the PhD. But why is childhood so significant within the, lit the literary world? Um, and why would it be a trope of such importance? Um, <clears throat> so, you know, as I pointed out, there's, there's something about the genealogies of African literature that lead us to this moment. I pointed out that uh, uh, many of these writers that I try to examine and their contemporaries, um, and, and they're, they're multiple, multitudes of them who've been publishing since the new millennium. Uh, they belong to what has been called the third generation of African writers. And it's important to go back to their experiences to be able to understand why childhood becomes important in how they narrativize their sense of identity and how they understand the world. And one of the things that comes through those experiences is that because many of these writers would have grown up here and then you know, migrated elsewhere, either in Europe and North America, childhood becomes this important moment uh, that they have to go back to for various reasons. And many of them left for different reasons. They are those who left uh, who, are, who are part of a, a sort of an emerging middle class that were able to travel and had the privilege to do that. There are others who left because of political coercion. There are others who left and became asylum seekers and refugees in other parts of the world. So there are various reasons why they'd have left. So childhood becomes this sort of important repository uh, that uh, allows them to uh, maintain a, a, a substantive connection with the continent, its imagination and their heritage, but also it allows them to begin to make sense of their own migrant subjectivities elsewhere. So, so, the, so you find an abundance of 
uh, figures and memories and images of childhood in their fiction. Uh, and this is how then it becomes such a substantive um, part of their zeitgeist, how they imagine their time. So a good example, of course, would be um, in one of the chapters that I, I write on post memory, and I look at uh, the figures of child soldiers. And for someone like Adichie, uh, particularly with Biafra, uh, she didn't experience Biafra. She was born in 1977. Biafra happened between 1967 and 1970. But she grew up with those stories because some of her family members died during the war. And so she inherited these stories and she grew up in a household where multiple stories were told about this war. Either an uncle who had, who had been part of a, a certain regiment, uh, uh, she lost both her grandfathers um, during this war. So it becomes this sort of um, uh, heirloom. It becomes a narrative heirloom. It becomes an inherited memory. So she has to engage with it. It, it defines how her childhood life um, unpacked itself in the 70s and 80s. And for someone like Chris Abani, for instance, he was in a slightly different situation where uh, his parents, he actually had to leave the country in the 90s because he was hounded out um, for some of his own writing. But, but he had also grown up with those stories of Biafra. And so there, there are different experiences of childhood uh, and different reasons that allow these people to leave the continent and go into other parts of the world. So childhood becomes this, it's not just a, a time to go back to, it becomes this conceptual space that can allow them to rethink their relationship to broader categories of identity, ethnicity, nation, and, 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 the, and the experience of diaspora. And so they are able to look at themselves as a, a contemporary generation that is slightly different from people like Ngugi and, and Achebe and Okri. So, so I have a chapter again called um, We Are Children of the Cold War and, and Binyavanga Inaina uh, has that formulation in his memoir. Uh, he's got a memoir called uh, One Day I Write About This Place where he talks about we are children of the Cold War who saw our countries crumple like paper. Uh, and, and that's a very sort of interesting experience because of course, an earlier generation would have gone through that, but they were not children when they went through that. So Binyavanga's generation were children. And so they have a slightly different perspective of that experience. And so they, you know, so childhood then becomes this set of ideas that allows these writers to narrativize and launch various projects of identity and, and their own sense of self um, within their fiction. I don't know if that answers your question, Amina. It did, it did. Thank you very much about that. And uh, I think the next question is from Mimi. Please feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Omar, for uh, making time to share your wonderful book. Uh, your book uh, reminds me of my own past research on childhood in Zimbabwe. I did my, my master's at UCT. Uh, looked at the constructs of childhood within a developmental framework. And um, just to kind of make a comment following um, Amina's question on why uh, childhood, or why it's important. I think from a developmental perspective, what I notice is that childhood is a good um, uh, um, phase to measure the efficacy of development in a country. Uh, in, my, in the context of rural Zimbabwe, uh, in my piece where I was doing my research, um, it was fascinating to see whether um, fragmented urbanity was working for childhood, to what extent um, it was able to support a developing human being. So by looking at um, those uh, uh, areas around childhood, I was able to analyze whether uh, development in Zimbabwe is, is, is uh, to what extent it's it's supporting uh, childhood developmentally and, and also with regards to public health. So I think that's that's for me from a developmental perspective. That's why childhood is important to to research on. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. And I mean, I'm I'm also just thinking about uh, No Violet Bulawayo's We Need New Names. I don't know if Minantle. I don't know if you you're familiar with that novel. Yes. Uh, yes, I am. Because it's it's a very sort of searing critique of um, a number of things in post-colonial Zimbabwe, especially in the 90s and I think the the new millennium, and and it, it it's a really interesting critique of um, 
the NGO, NGOization of rural life, for instance, in Zimbabwe and the rise of this sort of American dream. So I, I find it a really fascinating novel to engage with those questions around development and, and yeah. identity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Uh, we have a question from Sandy Young. Sandy, would you like to, to ask your question out loud? If not, I, I can read it. Um, so Sandy would like to ask you, Professor Uma, to share with us your sense of what you most hope the field will take note of and potentially be transformed by through this important work of your book on childhood. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much um, uh, for that question. I think that um, I think that what the book is trying to argue is that um, childhood is not just a, a concept about it's not just a concept about the development of, of identity. The childhood, uh, in the way that many of these writers narrativize it and engage with it, uh, create creates its own paradigms of understanding contemporary African identity. So. Uh, through these narratives of childhood, through these figures and images and memories of childhood, one is able to effect a critique of um, new thinking about nation and diaspora and ethnicity, but also to engage with questions of race and class and gender. So in other words, childhood uh, creates its own framework of engaging with these identities. And I think that um, that the, the, the narratives of these writers in their abundance gives us a sort of substantial ground from which to say that childhood has come of age. It's not just one something that is going to be resigned to some memory, but in fact, it, it, it is quite central to our understanding of contemporary African and African diasporic identities. In one of the chapters, the, one of the final chapters of the book, uh, I tried to uh, theorize the way that uh, migrant childhoods uh, in many of these contemporary African writers is beginning to uh, really allow us to rethink the concept of diaspora. So, you know, a good example would be Chimamanda's uh, Americana, or Helen Oyemi's um, uh, The Icarus Girl. And, and one of the things that those novels, amongst many others that I, I engage with in that chapter, try to really put their finger on the pulse of um, generations of diasporic Africans uh, across the Atlantic. And often the kinds of frictions, frictions and tensions that attend to um, the two sort of binary understandings, understandings of the concept of diaspora. Uh, the diaspora, historical diasporas um, of the middle passage and the contemporary diasporas of, of decolonization. How does one rethink a conceptualization of uh, contemporary diasporas of decolonization? How does one begin to not just decouple, but begin to see that there's, there's a whole demographic here uh, that is not necessarily immediately attached to the middle passage but which is beginning to tell its stories from across the Atlantic. So many of these narratives allow us to engage with that concept, re-engage it and reconfigure it, but continue to draw those connections with the historical diasporas. So I don't know if that answers your question, Sandy, but um, I, I'm hoping that uh, again, the work is going to open up um, uh, other, other interests in, in the area of literary childhood studies. I have to say though that, um, Part of what I, I also I also try to engage with is the way that the the continent you know when you go back to Hegel and them the continent is seen as um, I say it's a land of childhood and it's um, it hasn't developed and 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 this this notion that childhood does not affect any complex any complex or any complicated um, sense of the world or history uh, and I, in some ways in a, in a very sort of oblique way. Part of what I'm trying to do is to open up these narratives of childhood to look at how they're engaging with the continent in very complicated ways. On the one hand, you have childhoods of war, and the other, you have very complicated uh, senses of sexuality that emerge from uh, narratives of childhood. I've got a chapter that looks at childhood and, 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 and multidirectional desire and sexuality in the work of Chris Abani. So again, uh, this critique of childhood is really continuing this long history of thinking about Africa as a land of childhood. In, in, a, in what ways can you um, complicate that notion um, that came from people like Hegel and, and sort of um, debunk some of these myths about, about that metaphor in the continent and, and how it's circulating in other parts of the world. 
but but really my hope is that the book will signal to critics that that the zeitgeist of contemporary African literature can be seen in very substantive ways through the framework of childhood. If, if, the, if for instance, the nation state was a major sort of thematic concerns for the first generation of writers, I think contemporary African writers sort of because of their experiences effect certain critiques of, of these sort of normative sense of identity, the nation, ethnicity, they, they sort of effect a critique of that because of course, they grew up uh, during the Cold War when these concepts were beginning to fray. And so childhood becomes this sort of capacious category that can allow them to navigate the complexities of um, the, you know, the collapse of the nation state as a form of identity, the influence of ethnicity and the experience of migration. So childhood becomes this, this sort of set of ideas and framework that can allow us to understand the um, contemporary African identities and the kind of imagination that comes out of it. I hope that's I hope that's helpful. I'm sure it is. It absolutely is. Every single contribution you're doing today is is incredibly helpful. And we have another question from Nesiswa Nesiswa Titi. Uh, how, if in any way, do you imagine current experiences of childhood would add to your work on childhood? given that your work is reflective. Could, can you, could you please just read that again? I, I didn't hear yes. it. Yeah. Of course. How, if in any way, do you imagine current experiences of childhood would add to your work on childhood, given that your work is reflective? Uh, current experience of childhood, I mean, you know, um, I think, <clears throat> thank you for this question. Um, um, I, I think that the millennial age is sort of sort of defined by migration. And I'm hoping that my, my um, I'd imagine that, that the, the children of, of these writers that I'm working on, it could be seen. So if you think of so Adichie Abani and Helen Oyemi and Violet Bulawayo, the generation of writers that come after them, I suppose you'd say would be second generation migrants, if, if we take migration as, as a key analytic to, the contem to contemporary times, would be then say second generation migrants from uh, Adichie and them across the Atlantic. So I imagine that they would have, I don't know, I'd imagine that they would have um, uh, a slightly different experience of say the tensions between contemporary migrants in the US and and you know, his, the historical diasporas. I assume that they would have a slightly different take on that. Uh, I don't know if that, I don't know if I'm, I'm answering your question, but you know, um, I, I think that, that this generation of writers that I'm writing on have really consolidated the sense that migration is a significant part of identity formation. And I assume that um, current experiences of childhood would embrace that in, in more holistic ways without the tensions that some of these writers would have experienced in their own time uh, in the 80s and 90s, if they left the continent then and went into other parts of the world or around the continent. So I don't know if that, I don't know if that it's probably a roundabout way of engaging the question, but yes, I, um, that's how I'd respond to it. Yep, thank you. I agree I can work with that. Um, I was asking because um, I do work and I am focusing on the voices of children. So my work is, um, so I interact with have children between the, the ages of nine and um, 11. And I found that um, they, they, their own accounts of, of, of life and how they, 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 they view the, 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 the world is not in the, the, the same ways as we, we, we did. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering um, what, um, how these two may speak to each other and and the kinds of um, the kinds of list of the kinds of of lessons that that, that we would get in terms of um, helping children um, survive life as it were right now. So mm -hmm. I understand then what what you said about um, the fact that 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 would that and have a different outlook to mm. those experiences right now. So thanks for that, Professor. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I think that 
I think that migration has become a major part of how contemporary Africans you know, identify themselves. And I think I'd, I'd, I'd assume that a lot of the childhoods that um, would probably be narrativized in the last maybe five and the next five years uh, would comfortably straddle different spaces and different continents very comfortably without a sense that they have to, um, um, that they have to uh, um, just the footnote that uh, my daughter who's 11 months old has just, has just woken up um, and she's gonna be a part of the, <laughs> the background. Um, anyway, so I'd, I'd assume that these are identities that would comfortably straddle uh, different continents without the tensions that, um, come, that have come with that for past generations. So I don't know if you know, uh, you know, um, there's a Ghanaian American writer who came up with this notion of Afropolitanism and, and, and it generated a lot of discussion around, you know, this concept of new age Africans, new millennial Africans were able to travel the world and live in multiple European capitals, but still maintain uh, very sort of substant substantive connections with the continent. I assume that that would be the future of these kinds of challenges. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that, but yeah, thank, thank you, Neziswa, thank you. Thank you, Professor Uma. There's a question from Barbara Boswell. Would you like to ask the question? Okay, I will read it out loud. Could you please comment on the linkages between childhood, migration, and the trauma you have found, given the types of novels we explore? They all have experiences of trauma embedded in them to a greater or lesser extent. So the linkages between childhood, migration, and trauma. Yes, I mean, I mean, so first of all, the you know, the 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 you know, there's a there's a chapter in the book, the one that looks at uh, at memory and the Biafran war. And when we talk about trauma, and at least the way that the chapter tries to engage with this notion is that they're, you know, they're primary senses of trauma, and then they're those that are handed down through various stories. So they are secondary forms of trauma, either you know, these children witnessing members of the family who would have gone through this Biafra uh, that then becomes the substance of their narrative. Uh, and so that's very much alive in, this, in, in some of these novels. But there's also um, actual experiences of trauma within the process of migration. Uh, there's um, a Nigerian author who wrote a book called, um, a collection of stories called um, A Life Elsewhere. And that collection of stories is, is about experiences of children who would have gone through primary trauma in the continent who then leave as refugees or migrants or asylum seekers into other parts of the world. And it's a really incredible collection of short stories because it does, what it does is that it has two, two generations of one family who've gone through primary trauma and it begins to narrativize the way that this generation process it differently uh, across the Atlantic or wherever they, they, wherever they are. So the, you know, there's a short story in that piece, in that, in that collection, where you have, um, you have this family that uh, when, when we start reading the story, we are told of this family who are having their breakfast in a, in a quiet sort of migrant. Um, it's, it's a hotel of, of people who are asylum seekers or, or refugees who've been given accommodation. And, and he, the story doesn't tell us where this family is coming from, but there's the father and the mother and their kids and we are taken through the sort of stream of consciousness of each of these characters. Uh, the father and the mother who remember the trauma from where they're coming from is quite primary and, and they lost their jobs and, they, and the mother has a, a, a severed hand, which is not, it, it's a really uh, triggering story in some ways. But then the children react to this differently. While they remember being hustled out of their country and onto whatever mode of transport to wherever they are now, they, uh, very, they're quite, um, uh, they're quite extroverted in their engagements with the, with the migrant society that they live in. And they are processing this trauma slightly differently. So you have, so you have different, you know, sort of, um, you have a spectrum of trauma, primary and secondary and otherwise that, that percolates a lot of these narratives. Uh, so it just depends on, on, on which author is working on them, what sort of experiences they've gone through, or what are they imagining um, a different, you know, different narratives. So I don't know if that answers your question, Barbara. Um, but yeah, 
I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, I am here. Um, yeah, thank you. I would love, I'm really looking forward to reading more about this um, and the, the types of trauma that you mentioned specifically and intergenerational handed down trauma. I mean, it just sounds quite fascinating. And um, yeah, I have a number of questions that maybe ask them at, at another time. Thank you. Hmm. No, no, thanks, Barbara. I mean, I, I you know, the, I could give you different examples. So the, you know, you have Chris Abani who has this novel called, um, it's a short novel. Um, uh, it's, it's not quite about the Biafran war, but it's, it's about child soldiers. And it has this composite figure of a child soldier. It's called Song for Night. It's a, it's a short novel. It's got a, a, this composite figure. So he has put together a composite figure of a child soldier who could be from Sierra Leone or Liberia. So it's a narrative that, that sort of aggregates you know, the experiences of child soldiers, but the way he's processing uh, the trauma that is, that is in that context is really, really fascinating. You have this child who uh, belongs to a platoon of child soldiers who, uh, who's, um, and this is really triggering again, uh, um, I should just footnote that, whose uh, vocal cords have been severed. And so, and they're mind diffusers. And so they have to, they have to go and diffuse mines, you know, landmines, before the main platoons come in to occupy that space. And when they go in to diffuse those mine, mine, you know, landmines, of course, many of them die. And they, they, you know, the, the whole point of, of that platoon um, is like a, almost like a, I don't know how to put it, they're the front line of, of this, this sort of um, um, rebellious army that is trying to occupy that land. And so the, the, the shot that, you know, this novella is told from the point of view of one of those children, but, Aesthetically, it's quite fascinating because he, they're not speaking. This child is not speaking. So what you're hearing uh, are this child's thoughts. But again, these thoughts are not in English. They're in, um, in, in Igbo, uh, in a language that's not, you know. So, so Abani is trying to sort of, to sort of, sort of use a, a, a different tactic to engage with the, the subjectivity of a child soldier who is in the, in the minefields, who's trying to tell a, a really, really traumatic story. But it's a fascinating account. I don't know how to describe this. You're going to have to read this to understand how, um, how these contemporary writers are trying to engage with trauma through the point of, of view of, of this. So, so there are multiple levels of translation in this novel and sign language. So this, this child soldier is telling a story through sign language. And this sign language has been sort of translated onto the pages of the novel. And so you're, you have to go through, you're, you're, even though you take it for granted, but you're going through multiple levels of, of translation from the language in his brain to English, to sign language, to what's on the page. It's a really fascinating novel in that regard. So aesthetically, and again, the sort of questions it will ask about the ethics of representing trauma and that kind of thing are really fascinating. Just to give you an example, Barbara, thank you. Thank you, Professor Uma. We have Mimi with a question. Um, Hi, I hope you can hear me. So um, I just want to know how could you comment about the blurred lines between childhood and mothers? And the reason I'd like to hear your comment is because uh, where I come from and in my research, I found that one of the complexities of conceptualizing childhood in Matt Berland was that the mothers of the children um, were to some extent placed within um, the childhood boundary, which enforces patriarchy. For example, you know, in my own language, uh, you know, let's say two men are greeting, they would, uh, one would ask, which in literal uh, sense means, how are the children? So there's that referral to children and mothers as just children. So do you notice that in your stories? What is it that you find between uh, the, the, the boundaries between mothers and children, if, if any at all? Of course, thank you very much. Of course, there are, um, there are you know, part of what my, my, my book is trying to argue is in fact that uh, the perspective of childhood allows us to sort of effect a reconfigured critique of gender and patriarchy, particularly. Um, and, you know, we know that African feminist literary criticism has done a lot of work in that regard. Um, you'll have to go back to generations of feminists from the 1940s uh, 
who began to debunk this idea that that motherhood uh, is going to define what sort of human beings they are. Um, and so from then on, there's been a long history of, of critique within, within literary studies um, um, around that. Uh, but what is interesting about childhood is to think about uh, girlhood. Um, uh, and, and that's what comes out of, of gendered childhood. So just girlhoods and boyhoods and, and, and questions around sexuality in relation to that. And that's what my book tries to go into. Um, uh, and of course, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the demographic of children um, has always been blurred by, um, by, that, by that of motherhood. But at the same time, what I'm trying to argue is that, uh, that these writers try to decouple that and to try to say, uh, that in fact, childhood on its own is gendered uh, and it, it experiences patriarchy in its own sort of dimensions. Um, if you read, say, Papula Ibiscus, uh, uh, you'll see that Chimamanda's Papula Ibiscus, she has this story of this really violent father um, who is a, a wealthy sort of middle class. So you, you have, so essentially you have like experiences of childhood that, that are about middle class families and families that are escaping a certain sort of class dynamic and end up and in sort of lower, you know, uh, working class. So there are different class dimensions of it. But what is constant about all of these is just the weight of that Patrick. And um, in Chimamanda's Papla Ibiscus, you see, this is a wealthy middle-class family of a father who uh, is quite a, a religious fanatic. He's a Catholic man. And he, it's, it's quite interesting that the, um, the the rituals that that attend to, uh, to to Catholicism become become this character in the novel, and and they they create these silences and tensions and 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 burdens for the family members and particularly the child who's narrating this story. And so you know they, they often you find in the case of of this child in Papli Biscus being a witness to the kind of violence that is being uh, visited on her mother and telling it slightly differently. So, so what, how do you explain? How do you sort of engage with that kind of trauma, where you have this child who is, who is constantly witnessing this violence, while at the same time it's it's filtering down to them in other ways within the family, the family dynamics. Um, so, so suddenly, uh, Minente, uh, there was that blurring of, of motherhood and childhood, and children were lumped together. But, but I also think that these writers are trying to decouple that and to say, in what ways can we? Reflect a critique of patriarchy through gendered childhoods, and yeah. I have a chapter on, on sexuality, in fact, uh, which looks at uh, Chris Abani's um, um, Chris Abani's uh, Graceland and the Virgin of Flames, which which are about you know the, the sociality of childhood uh, and 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 the effects of that on on how they inhabit a gendered world, and and therefore the, the choices of, of sexuality. Yeah. Uh, so again, I, I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, but... yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you, Mimi. I have a question, Professor Uma, which is about um, childhood within within North African literature, and if it was an area that you were that you were able to explore um, within the book. No, not, not really. It's largely sub-Saharan and largely Anglophone, at least in the in the broader sense of the word. Uh, but I'm I'm certainly interested in um I know that uh, Nawal El Sadawi passed away recently. And I, I am familiar with the works of um uh uh he, he got the Nobel Prize, Egyptian author got the Nobel Prize in the 80s. Um Najib Mahfouz. Najib Mahfouz, I'm familiar with his works, and, and, and that, but that's an older generation, including Nawal. So I, I don't really look at, at Northern Africa other than the Atlantic sort of diasporas. But I think, you know, you have, from the Horn of Africa, you have um, people in Ethiopia who also sort of make connections uh, with North Africa. You have uh, Dino Mengistu. Um, you have a number of authors from, from the Horn of Africa who make those connections. And I think there are other people who might be doing work on the on 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 that, and and I assume you know Northern Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Umar. I know Azza has a question. Azza, please. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Professor Umar. This is very fantastic uh, like session. We are very glad to have you here with us. 
Uh, my question is actually about, I mean, you talked about the, like, like you have this the chapter on sexuality. So I was actually, what when you were talking about that, came to my mind um, the human trafficking, especially human trafficking of, of how this involves, you know, to, uh, to work as um, somehow in, in the form of slavery that, um, I mean, slavery didn't end, you know, never ending, never going to end. Um, so those girls who were taken and like somehow abducted and were taken and uh, to work as uh, uh, like sex slaves or to work in houses in the domestic uh, world. So I would want to see if your book is reflected on that kind of experience and the, the trauma, like the primary trauma of, of these girls. Thank you. Thank you, Aza, for that question. I, I don't really look at that. Um, I know that uh, Chris Abani, for instance, I think, I think narratives of those experiences are gonna start coming out. But Chris Abani has written a novel about, about the trafficking of a particular girl. And I didn't write on that, but I do, I think it's, I do mention it. Uh, and, and that's the example that I know amongst his contemporary writers. I think there will be more stories about that and, and Chibok and, you know, you know, you know, the stuff that's happening in, in Northern Nigeria. I think we'll have a lot of those stories coming out in future uh, because there's a lot of attention on, um, on these children who are being abducted, either trafficked abroad, as you say, for various sort of nefarious reasons, but also the, the sort of radicalization uh, that, that is assumed to attend to, to, to some of those societies um, uh, or, or the kind of leverage that people use for children to either get ransom or that kind of thing. I think that those narratives are going to start coming out. But Chris Abani has written a novel. I just, at the top of my head, I can't remember the title, but it does engage with the trafficking of, of, this, of, of, of one girl. And Chris Abani is a fascinating writer because, you know, his narratives really engage masculinities in fascinating ways. Because in that novel, he's writing the novel from the perspective of this, of this girl child. And for a male author to take on that subjectivity and to render it, um, ethically and, and um, believably uh, is, is a really beautiful thing and it's, it's really important. And in some ways, it, um, my chapter on sexuality does look at how Chris Abani's narrative masculinities are about debunking certain, certain gendered senses of authorial voicing, that how do, if he was to represent um, a, a differently, a sort of a, a, if he was to reference different kinds of masculinities, what kinds of authorial subjectivities are going to take to represent those in ways that are believable and that actually uh, make a difference in how we think about sexuality and childhood, right? So I, I don't really touch on that, but that's the one example I know. And I believe there'll be more uh, narratives coming out in, in the near future, certainly. Um, you, can, you can take that to the bank. I think there'd be a lot of stories that will come out of that. Because of course, there have been stories that have come out of, of, of of theaters of war. You have, you have Emmanuel Jal who wrote this diary on, uh, as, as a child soldier. You have China Keitetsi from Uganda who wrote the story about growing up as a child soldier and as a girl in Uganda. So suddenly you'll have uh, narratives that in future that engage with that experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Azza. Thank you, Professor Uma. It's where we've arrived to, to the end of the session. Um, and I believe we should, be, we should be able to send through the notes and the presentation that uh, Dr. Mkhize has done to everyone who's joined us today. I believe we have everyone's email as you have registered for this, for this webinar. And I invite you all to engage with, with the works of Professor Uman to flood his inbox with even further questions once you've once you've read um, the chapters of the book, I'm particularly interested in in reading the in reading the chapter on sexuality and understanding it um, and 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 diving into um, the experiences that that you've spoken about. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just wanted to say that you can share the chapter that I shared with you with the people who attended. Okay. Uh, who attended this book launch? I shared with them the introductory chapter, so um, you're free to share it. I, I can give you my, my, my permission to do that. Thank you so much. I will do that right after the, this ends um, while 
lies in with uh, Dr. Fu with for the emails. Thank you. And I know that Dr. Mkhize will also send um, his notes. Thank you so much, Professor Uma. Uh, is there any final thing or final point that you would like to, to say? Well, I thought I would read maybe a paragraph or two uh, from the book, but I think people can uh, get, get the book and read for themselves. But if there's a couple of minutes, I can read just a couple of paragraphs. Uh, please do, please do. Uh, I'm just gonna have to step out and get, <laughs> get the book from the other room if you don't mind. No, not at all. Thank please you. So please stay with us uh, because we have Dr. Professor Uma who's gonna read. Um, paragraphs of his book. If you have to go, we will be sending um, the chapter to your inbox. Thank you. So this is, a, this is just the first few paragraphs of um, chapter five, which is titled Queer Childhoods and Multidirectional Desire. Um, um, thank you for your indulgence. I really appreciate, um, I appreciate your time. Uh, so this chapter returns to a crucial framework for engaging contemporary African literature if childhood has been used as a set of ideas to infantilize the continent, to invent a discursive system and produce knowledge about Africa in relation to the Occident, the category of sexuality has also generated a particular imagination uh, of the continent. Moreover, if Africa's history of colonialism foregrounded connections between imperialism and patriarchy. It also engendered uh, an overdetermining logic of sexuality as paradigmatic and normative to species of intimacy, desire, and affect. The logic of imperialism meant that collective identities were channeled through the platform of the nation state. Forms of freedom, liberty, and citizenship were founded on the hope of acquiring the platform of the state after colonialism. So post-colonial citizenship arrived defined by hopes of freedom and liberty that were already fashioned to be realized in the received platform of the nation state. Soon after, these new forms of citizenship began to yield asymmetrically gendered um, freedoms and rights as African feminist scholarship has so aptly demonstrated. New forms of second-class citizenship underwrote the facade of independence as a public performance that swept under the carpet the denial of private freedoms, and desires while creating a hierarchical divide that defined the public as political and the private struck domestic as apolitical. This division of political labor rested on the foundation of a coalition between imperial and anti-colonial patriarchies. From these emerged ideas of national subjectivity that were aligned to be heteropatriarchal. Um, contemporary African literature has brought back critical attention to the question of sexuality, sexual practices, and broader assumptions about collective African identities. In this way, it has generated a critical examination of African identities in a field that can be broadly defined as queer African studies. Contemporary African literature allows for the connections between literary childhood studies and queer studies. The imagination of childhood places the formation of gender and sexuality at the heart of thinking through the contemporary as the age of queer. Osinubi describes this as the era of queer emergence in reference to how the figure of the queer multiply defined has acquired prominence in recent acts of legislation in East Africa and West Africa, but also in reference to recent publicness of the topic. Contemporary African writers have brought sexuality and sexual practices to the foreground of African literary imagination and to the public discourse on African identities. Narratives that imagine and engage with non-conforming queer uh, non-conforming gender sexual practices and identification such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, and intersex having emerged to define public discourse on contemporary African identities, while the promulgation of queer citizenship was already the foundation of South Africa's new constitution, the emergence of narratives in East and West Africa since the turn of the millennium have generated engagements of queer Africa as a new social imaginary. Okay, I think that's a uh, that's just a, a sort of tease on, on the chapter, on that particular chapter. Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence. <laughs> Thank you. I see lots of people applauding and we've been so glad and delighted to have you today. Uh, thank, you. thank you everyone for joining. You will receive um, the ch a chapter from Professor Uma's book uh, to your inbox uh, by end of today.
And again, feel free to connect with him. Professor Uma, would you like to, to drop um, your email on the chat box? Of course. If anyone would be, if anyone would like to, to reach out and ask more questions. Um, thank you very much um, once again, and please stay tuned with um, the various speakers that are joining us um, on every Monday for the book Lunches and Lunches. So we have authors who are joining us to launch their books, and we have others who are will be joining us um, at Huma to discuss their books throughout the year. We have a great lineup of speakers, um, and we'll be announcing those on the website, on Twitter, and Facebook. Um, Please have a have a great afternoon. Uh, thank and thank you. you for joining. Thank you, Amina. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.